Uh, good day. Uh, thank you for joining us in today's discussion on forced evictions, forced, um, rather forced uh, relocations and evictions. Uh, my name is Edward Malupi. I am a researcher at the Socioeconomic Rights Institute. And today I'm being joined on this forged discussion by Kelly Kropman and Spuzi Gote. I'll just briefly give an introduction to both of them before we get into our discussion today on the topic at hand. So um, Kelly Kropman is currently practicing as a private attorney. She runs the firm Kropman Attorneys, which is located in uh, Rosebank Center in, in Johannesburg. Before working as a legal profession, before working in the legal profession, rather, um, Kelly completed her Bachelor's of Education at the University of Johannesburg and then completed her LLB four years later with, with it. Now, while she was studying for her LLB, she did a lot of interns with a couple of public interest law centers in South Africa. And she then went on to complete her articles and uh, um, uh, at the Legal Resources Center and practiced there up until late 2017. Um, so yeah, Kelly, thank you for joining us and looking forward to the discussion with you. Thank you. And we also have with us um, Sbuzi Gode. Uh, Sbuzi Gode is a founding president of the Sheikh Dollars Movement, Abashalibas and John Dolo. Now, Uzi Gota here has campaigned for the right to decent housing across the world, really, um, mostly here in South Africa, well known in the province of KwaZulu Natal, and, but they have footprint across the country. Um, and, and he's also done a lot of work um, internationally as well, um, mostly also in, in, in the US. And under his stewardship, Abashali has really grown to be one of the largest social movement um, of the impoverished that has, that has emerged in post-apartheid um, South Africa. And so he joins us today and will be giving us a lot of his vision, expertise, and also drawing on experiences from the wealth of knowledge and experience that Abashali has. Thank you for joining us, uh, Babzi Gott. Now, I, I, I think um, to, to start this off. Thank you, Edward. I, thank you so much for inviting me. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, the discussion that, that we're having is, is not really new in, in the South African landscape, in that um, we have a rich history, unfortunately, a rich history of. Um, forced removals of, um, of, 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 of informal settlements of urban dwellers, black urban dwellers in most instances. And even in the current dispensation, we are seeing a continuation of evictions and forced removals um, in, from, with people being forced out of their homes, both individually and also as um, informal settlements in a city buildings and, 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 and um, all of those things. Now, Babsbu, just starting with you, I just wanted to get a sense from you on whether it is important for us to frame forced removals um, coming from a broader history rather than just focusing on, on them as individual cases, but looking at them at a more broader level and saying that this is something that has been going on um, from our past history and it is continuing up until this day. Is, is, is there any importance in, in drawing that linkage? Yes, uh, Brad, thank you so much for the opportunity. Just want to thank um, the folks from FOR, you know, for having this uh, discussion and having us here. So, well, the question is very um, closer to, to our hearts. And I just want to say that um, the 
topic itself has to be located within the broader, uh, um, um, you know, history of, of the South African, uh, 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 you know, from the colonial uh, times to the above date. So it, it has it has to be located in in that context. So um, I think South Africa has a, a real terrible history of forced removal of mainly uh, African people in their own soil of birth. This state work was um, undertaken by the former white minority government and we thought they did so because of the color and the apartheid laws of the past. However, today uh, these um, forced removals are undertaken by the black um, democratic government and these uh, forced removals uh, or evictions are today motivated by greed and abuse of power. They are motivated by self-hate and disregard for our humanity and for the law itself. They are motivated by the economic policies that further market at the expense of the most uh, impoverished people in our society. A market that has put profit before human needs. Um, some of these evictions have just been used to score political goals, you know, while our um, hands are tight um, in this um, COVID 19 pandemic. So, this is one of the sad stories that we have to discuss this issue in the context of what is taking place right now. Precisely. Uh, I mean, and, and I think if we think about it, um, so we are currently con 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 um, discussing this in the context of a global pandemic, right? And we have also been seeing that evictions have been taking place even during this lockdown. Um, now, Kelly, I, I just want to bring you in here a bit and just to discuss the law a bit on what are evictions legally speaking? Um, what, what, how, how are they termed and framed in, in terms of the law? So in terms of thinking about residential evictions as opposed to commercial evictions, where people are forced out of the places where they live, this, in theory, is regulated by, the, by two distinct acts. The first is the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, which we call PI, and the other relates to people who are living in rural settings called the Extension of, the, of Tenure Act, um, uh, Extension of Security of Tenure Act, excuse me, called ESTA. These two pieces of legislation protect people in the context of where they live and makes it so that it has to be a balancing of the interests and rights of both the occupier of the, of the space as well as the owner of the space and coupling that with the interest of justice. These are, of course, what, what is re recorded on paper in terms of our legislation. What we've observed with regards to what the state has done during lockdown is to try and circumvent this legislation and to say that people have been erecting shacks that they have not been occupying and therefore there are grounds to remove the, the structures that have been put in place as a part of land occupation. This is not, strictly speaking, complying with the legislation. It's sidestepping it, it's circumventing it for the purposes of, of legal expediency, but whether or not this is lawful is a question that different courts have come up with different conclusions. So we saw at the beginning of the lockdown in Kwazulu Natal, people were forcibly removed from, from places where they were dwelling and the courts dismissed the application, saying that this was not an eviction, this was just preventing land, uh, uh, the, the occupation of land. Whereas in the Western Cape, we saw something very similar happen and the courts found the opposite was true. Now, looking at what evictions and, and evictions are in South Africa, it really does speak to a process that the, the owner or that the, the entity that has rights in the property, ownership, for example, is able to apply to a court and have an order enabling the sheriff and the police to remove certain people. This is very different from an unlawful eviction, which can take many forms, but where a court order is not secured. I don't know if I've answered your question or if I've 
rambled on. A yes, bit. no, no. I, th I think um, it's just to give a perspective of what we are discussing and what we're looking at when, when we speak about evictions. Um, so now I want us to consider what this means in the context of a lockdown, right? Um, so we spoke about that there are evictions taking place, and you've mentioned a few of these cases, Kelly, around um, evictions that have taken place during a lockdown and how different courts have responded to them. But I want us to get to a sense of why was it important in the first place that there was a moratorium um, declared on, against evictions taking place during the lockdown. Uh, I'll start that with you, Kelly, and then come uh, to you, Babzi, got on it. So in terms of the COVID-19 disaster management regulation, the imperative was to keep people from migrating or moving in any way or form. And one of the things that is required for that is to prevent people from physically changing their address and interacting from one community to another. This follows that people shouldn't move and therefore shouldn't be forced to move. Uh, the flattening the curve imperative of the state meant that evictions as well as voluntary moving of people had to cease. So there was a rational connection between the moratorium of evictions and the emergency relief scheme that was put in place. And this was a nat national directive, national regulations that compelled all to respond similarly. Different municipalities have interpreted the regulations in different ways and that has led to some very unfortunate outcomes for people mm -hmm. within certain municipalities. Okay, so Babzi Gota, this is where I'd like to, to bring you in on these experiences. Um, I think Abashali have experienced a lot of these firsthand. Um, could you just maybe take us through one or two cases of um, evictions that Abashali um, communities I've experienced during the lockdown and, and what it looked like. Yeah, well, the evictions have been very terrible. I must say they are ongoing almost every day. Uh, we were shocked that on the very first day of the national lockdown and on the very same day of the regulation that the, of the directive that the Minister of uh, Justice and Correctional Services um, also, the Minister of Human Settlement, Water and Sanitation, so we have issued a directive that uh, evictions should stop at this time of COVID-19. But not only within South Africa, there has been a worldwide ban on evictions, also by the UN, special reportee on the situation of housing. So, um, but again, uh, these uh, directives were ignored completely by um, some of our city governments, like your Etewini, city of Cape Town, city of Johannesburg. So it's, it's really worrying. But of course, uh, there's been at least eight evictions that took place on the first week of the national lockdown. Uh, just, uh, just wanted to focus. Pass on, on two of those, uh, that would be the Azania um, um, eviction, but also the Ekenana um, evictions. Starting with Ekenana, Ekenana have been living there since um, two years ago, and we've obtained an interdict against the city at least in February 2019. So already there's an interdict that interdict the city from evicting or demolishing or you know destroying the belongings of the people so we have an existing interdict that we've secured at least two years ago but the city in full violation of that goes to uh, to the community and evict people in full violation of the existing interdict let alone these current national directives and you know so that tells you a different story about the kind of cities we have that are law unto themselves, that you cannot, that they cannot adhere to the rule of law themselves. So the second one obviously has been the Azania. We uh, made uh, an application to court in order to, you know, um, get an interdict so that the community can live safe um, during this time. But again, as Kelly alluded, the, um, applica our application was, was dismissed 
but contrary to that, similar case in Cape Town, the judge reacted differently. Um, then you can kind of sense that Kwasiru Natal is becoming a republic of Kwasiru Natal in its own right, that it doesn't adhere to the national you know, legislations and so on. All right. Now, Kelly mentioned something um, around some of the arguments that we are seeing in court, right? Um, and this relates to, for example, the argument that the different municipalities are actually not uh, destroying people's homes, but they are preventing uh, land occupations or land invasions, as they term them. But you have alluded to a case, Babzi Gorte, where people have been staying on land for uh, at least two years that can be proven even in terms of the court papers and um, the municipal engagement in that. Now, how, what, what does this say about um, the different municipalities and, and how they are conducting these, these, these evictions and the argument that they are presenting? What, what's your take on that, Babzikwa? Well, my take is, is that you cannot expect citizens to uphold the law and the constitution when state agencies and state institutions themselves um, do not respect the rule of law. So, um, I mean, these officials will tell us, law or no law, they are in charge. That it tells you the kind of authority that we have that really subverts the law or um, think that law only applies to the citizen and it does not apply to the officials and, you know, city authorities. So it is a worrying factor. It is an attempt to our constitutional democracy, which was hardly won to be allowing people who are occupying such a respect, respectable positions in, in our cities to, you know, um, to actually, um, you know, ignore the rule of law. So then it tells you a story that, um, South Africa is in the brink of really collapsing in terms of the institutions that have been set up, you know, to uphold our constitutional democracy. It is really a worrying factor that you would then expect ordinary citizens to be abide by the rule of law when those who are meant to be custodians of our law. So it is a disgrace to our society. It is an insult to the people of South Africa who have fought so hard to establish these strong institutions that support our democracy. All right, uh, Kelly, um, we we'll say something around that's, that's a bit worrying or should at least worry us and unsettle us a bit, which is related to the rule of law and how that is sort of like being negated in a way. Now, I, I, I just wanted to get input from you on what can people do, even in... Um, you know, individual cases where I am being evicted from my own home, um, even during this lockdown, or unlawfully being evicted on in ordinary circumstances. What what kind of avenues can I can I do to ensure that rule of law is still something that is still um, being observed in, in in this country? Thank you. I, I think it's a very difficult question to answer because the first thing that's, that needs to happen is for people to be educated about what their rights are and what it is that, people, that they can enforce against others. And that isn't drafted in a way that's easily accessible. It's often not in languages that people can access. And then dealing with law enforcement, which should, if somebody's trying to unlawfully evict you, the first thing you should do is go to the police. Dealing with law enforcement can be difficult because law enforcement is sometimes not aware of what their responsibility is. And then, of course, in terms of questions of access, th this is a question of access to justice. And that is also an incredibly difficult thing for people to access um, because attorneys are prohibitively expensive because there are too few law clinics and, and open access law spaces, and because the educational material is few and far between. So I think the first thing, unfortunately, is for people to take the very difficult stance 
of educating themselves about what the the state of the of law is and able to hold others accountable and it's through that educational avenue that people can then hold law enforcement accountable their local but without the knowledge that for example your water and electricity can't be cut off without notice or that uh, you cannot be evicted without a court order and that you must be given an opportunity to defend yourself people don't know that people aren't aware of that so the difficulty is to become educated about a very complicated system of laws that is not accessible to most people. And for that reason, civil society, unfortunately, has to take up the mantle of distributing and, and assisting in the educational process, which shouldn't be anybody but the state's responsibility, but South Africa is as it is. And accountability really comes into the form. Can we hold our municipal officials accountable? Do we need to go to court and get a cost order in order to hold them accountable? Do we need to go to IPAD every time a police officer refuses to assist a person or indeed is uh, contrary to the rule of law? And police brutality in the time of, of lockdown is a, a terribly addictive thing of police not understanding their role and responsibility and the state not holding those who, who violate their duties seriously. So I think, sadly, I think education is, is, is the first point that people need to come to, but I don't by any stretch try and discount that as an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned something about the role of law enforcement and that they also maybe don't know what they're supposed to be doing. What exactly is their role when it comes to evictions? So it depends on what kind of eviction we're talking about. If we're talking about an unlawful eviction between a private landlord and a private tenant or a private occupier, the landlord cannot evict somebody without a valid court order. So if they go into the, if the landlord goes into the property and tries to physically remove somebody without a court order, then law enforcement can be called in to prevent the unlawful action. If, however, we're talking about a lawful eviction where a court order is in place and the sheriff needs additional assistance, they can call on the police service to assist in such an eviction. So it's about preventing unlawful action from taking place and assisting in when lawful action should be taking place. Police will be, I've had many clients who have called the police and said, my property is being occupied or my landlord's trying to kick me out or help me. And the police said, it's a civil matter. It has nothing to do with me. Go and sort out your house. Mm. And this is not in a rural context. This is a very urban context um, where police are not, should not, no police should be seen as a law unto themselves, but these police are not isolated from access to information. Mm -hmm. um, so the role of the police is two-phased. Depends on whether you've got a court order or you don't and also whether we're in lockdown or we're not. Great. I mean, I, I think it, 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 it puts um, things into perspective there and what we should expect of the police when we see them um, in, 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 yes. in evictions and how they should be conducting themselves. Um, I think maybe it's just um, one other point that we... I think I'll, I'll take this to, to Bob Zigota, which is something, Kelly, that you, you, you've mentioned. Um, how are Abashali going about uh, Bob Zigota in terms of awareness and how people should know their rights? Uh, is, is that something that's happening within Abashali settlements? And if that knowledge is of any assistance at all when it comes to these evictions? Uh, yes, I firstly want to um, concur to what Kelly was saying, the importance of self-education, uh, getting, you know, empower yourself with knowledge in as far as this topic is concerned. I think we are doing that quite uh, incredibly, you know, as a Bachali, we are proud to actually say we have done all we can to make sure that our members understand uh, 
the, especially uh, the, the price and their, their right, the, the right to housing. And you will be very surprised to note that many of our um, elderly women in the informal settlement can tell you about section 26 of the constitution. And they know exactly what to ask when these law enforcement come to their communities, whether or not they do have the eviction orders uh, in the first place when they, they come to evict people. Unfortunately, all those uh, questions, um, whether or not the, it is in the knowledge of the law enforcement eviction orders to be approaching these communities in the first place, I don't know. But I can safely say that we have invested so much in educating ourselves and educating our communities around their, 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 their rights and as far as the right to housing is concerned, mainly around section 26 uh, that really confirm that no one may be evicted from their homes or have their homes demolished without an order of court. But uh, amongst the hundred evictions that we have faced as a Bashali, maybe there was only one particular instance that the Etegwini have, have been seen obtaining a court order. So most of these evictions that are taking place are not only unlawful in the sense that they have not been carried out without a court order, but they have been violent in, in many ways. So um, I think uh, in as far as the education process uh, go in Abakhali, um, it is safe for us to say we have done all we were supposed to do in terms of building capacity of our members, understanding the rule of law. However, the narrative is shifting, as you alluded earlier on, that it is no longer about, you know, law enforcement, uh, you know, evicting people who are already in, in occupation. It's kind of, um, the narrative shift is to say people are evicted because they are invading land, or they are, uh, of course, um, the cities are preventing uh, land occupations. But we know, as we have um, outlined the incident that some of these communities already have court orders, but they are just targeted for some political uh, reason, but also to show us that some bunch of hooligans or gangsters are in, in power, and therefore they will use this power uh, and abuse this power that they have been given by the electorate. So that, that's the, 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 the worrying factor. But of course, the further question to what um, Kelly was explaining to us now that you have educated yourself, now that you know, you know the procedures that should be followed, then what do you do when the law enforcement agencies continue to violate the law? Not that they don't, don't know, um, they are deliberately um, engaging into unlawful you know, um, and violent activities. So that's the extreme position that Abakhali faces now that we all have information at our disposal, we have we all have resources whether to litigate or not. But the city uses its power, uses its resources to subvert the law, but also to send a message that they are in power using the hitmen. Some of the people are taken from the taxi industry using violence. And then when you go to the police to report what we see it as crimes, the police won't even help you. That they decide not to attend to your queries. Like in the uh, um, example of Ekenan, where large ammunition were fired to, to people and people were hospitalized. The community had the cartridge and took it to Ito or Katome police station as an evidence to say, someone has been shot, here is the evidence, the cartridge. And the police chose not to accept uh, these um, cartridges as evidence. They chose not to open a criminal case against um, the land invasion unit personnel. So what do you make out of these uh, instances? It's not a, a question of proving or not proving you know, the incident, but the police refuses or they would rather work um, with the law enforcement uh, agencies not to do what they are supposed to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe it's, it's also at this point to note that um, the Forge is doing a number of these um, discussions and they've also done one discussion on um, police brutality 
during um, this period of, of, of COVID. And I think um, some of our viewers should also go and check out some of the other discussions that have been um, put out on, on this platform. Um, I, I think maybe just to wrap things up, um, what is the one thing, right? If you were to just think about it, sit and think about it, what is the one thing that you think people should know um, when it comes to evictions? What's the, if there was a gem that you wanted people to pick up uh, or hold with them uh, on issues related to evictions and uh, forced removals, what, what's, what's that one thing? Um, th th there are many things. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I would say that it, with regards to evictions, especially between private land property owners and private tenants, it is not always the overarching question about whether or not one has paid for occupation, but whether or not it is in the interest of justice that a person may be removed from from a property. And so there's the occupier of a building, the occupier of a space, in, at least in terms of the theories of the rule of law, has more power than just whatever economic value is attributed to them. And that we shouldn't view people's value in, in terms of their, their powers around evictions purely as that of an economic story. Um, because I think often people put themselves down to a number. Can I afford it? Can't I afford it? And forget that they, there is a higher standard, which is the interest of justice, whether it is just and equitable to force somebody to leave a space. Mm -hmm. That's the first that comes to mind. There are many, many important points that need to be addressed. I, I, I love that point. <laughs> Bob, Bob Zikote? Well, for me, uh, two things that comes into my mind. One is the demand for Abakal is that legalize the right to land. Guarantee the right to land as you guarantee the right to housing because the right to housing has no much effect without the right to land because where are you going to build this house? What's the point of guaranteeing the right to housing when you do not guarantee the right to, to, to land? And the second thing, we want to see the removal of land as a property, as, some, as a commodity. Land should not be a commodity. So as long as the land remains a commodity, of course, it, it will be there for those who can support economically. So the inequality that continue to terrorize South Africa will continue as a result of our social and uh, social economic um, background and so on. So if you can legalize the land and, and also make land as a right, as a common, you know, good to be owned collectively rather than land to be for the survival of the future. So if you have money, then it all goes. So if you don't have money, then you are nowhere. So we'll continue to have this problem unless the right to land is guaranteed to in, in the constitution of itself. Thank you. I, I think we will wrap it there unless if there are any last pending issues. Uh, are, are, we, are we happy with where we are right now? Great. Um, let's, let me thank you both uh, for participating in this. Uh, it has been a very insightful and rich discussion and one that I think we need to have as, as a country around um, the value that we place um, on, on, on people, as, as Kelly has, has, has alluded to, that you are more than just economics, but there is more value to you as, as, as a human, and that we should be looking at issues of land and access to land and um, as they say, some, uh, some of our colleagues that land for people, not for profit. And so I, I, I think these are the kind of discussions that we should, we should, we should be having. I mean, I think just in closing, um, we would do well to thank the Forge 
for um, hosting this discussion for us. And thank you both on behalf of the Forge for participating and giving the input that you have um, given to this discussion. And we hope that someday we will have a more progressive, a um, more equalitarian and a more um, equal society. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Oda. Bye, Kelly. Bye, thank you.